We're going to continue our study that we started, and then we missed a couple of weeks, Operation, the Operation of Faith. And we looked at our inheritance and what Jesus purchased for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. We saw in Ephesians that it's by grace, through faith, and that not of ourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Isn't that wonderful? We are his workmanship. Therefore, everyone who is a child of God, who's made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life, is his workmanship. And he doesn't do any sloppy work. So we're all created in the image of God. We have Jesus on the inside and we're in Jesus. So what God's made is perfect. And God has given us all things richly to enjoy. We saw that in 2 Peter 1.3. And in Ephesians 1.3 we saw that, that he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We also saw in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that the promises are yea and amen in Jesus. So all, every promise was completed in Jesus. Jesus paid the price, so when we're in him, we have all the promises. We're not working for them. They've been given to us. Everybody say, I'm not working for it. Jesus worked for it. He paid the price for it. They are now mine because I'm in him and he's in me. This is so important because we get so involved in what we can do as far as getting something instead of what we do to release what we've already got. And there's a big difference and we've been looking at that. We saw in... um, Hebrews 13, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then we looked at faith. Faith. Operation of faith. What is faith? And we we looked at that because sometimes faith is sort of one of those spiritually religious words that we know without faith it's impossible to please God, and faith calleth those things that be not as though they are. But what is faith? And going into Strong's Concordance and looking at all of the various meanings and going into the dictionary and Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, they come up with conviction of a truth. Faith is conviction of the truth of anything. The belief in the New Testament of a conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God. Are you convicted and are you persuaded and do you trust what the word says about your relationship to God? That Jesus became sin so that you would be made the righteousness of God in Christ. You're made that, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what faith is, totally trusting the word of God. Believing and trusting and adhering to what it says. That's faith. It's not something you work up. And I know it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we take that trust in the word. Trust in Jesus. Trust in the promises. Trust in what God will do. Trust in what he says he will do comes by hearing the word. By hearing and hearing and finding out and getting revelation knowledge no person can give you revelation knowledge you will get head knowledge and we studied that i don't that could have been the series we did the enemy within mental ascent so we can get head knowledge but then it says there's a scripture that says ever learning and never coming to the truth Meaning not getting a revelation of who Jesus is and what he did. And only the Holy Spirit can give you that. 
And this is why we keep getting the word and we put the word in and we speak the word. This is why praying in other tongues is so important. Praying in other tongues gives helps as far as revelation, making us sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So that's what faith is. Faith, a strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. Belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence. So when you see faith, you can look, faith is the substance. Then my confidence, my assurance that Jesus is the Messiah, that he did what he, the word says he did. That Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I, he changes not. My confidence in that will now promote me to doing something else. It'll cause me to rely on him and trust him. <clears throat> we also rely on the character. In 1 John, it says these two commandments are given. That you love one another as I have loved you. And you believe on the name. And the name there means authority and character of the Son of God. One, you have to believe the name of Jesus. Name means authority. You have to believe that Jesus has authority in this over all the realm, over Satan, that he defeated him. And he's put that authority in us. He's given us that dominion, the right to use his authority. And his character. I believe that God's character, Jesus' character, has been smeared more than anybody else's. What do you believe about God and his character? If there's one negative thought that you have pertaining to God, his word, and his character, you have to find the word to turn that around in your life. Because we have to believe in his character, that he's good, kind, patient, because he is love, so he's all those things. So we're never to interpret God or the word by the experiences we have or other people's experiences. Because if the, our experiences doesn't line up with the word, sometimes we come away with, well, this is what I, I was praying, and I was praying at the foot of Mount whatever, and this is still what happened to me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Your experience does not change the word of God. Amen. My experience does not change the integrity of the word of God. My experience does not change God's character. <coughs> Ever. So the minute we go, well, this is, I did this and I did that and I did this. And, and we get this idea that we're always, always, always doing everything right. Right. And we don't want to change because of pride. But we're not to interpret the word of God by our experiences, but by the birth, the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, seating at the right hand of the Father of Jesus. Everything is to be interpreted through that. And what happened and what was accomplished there. Because we're going to look at the scripture. It says we preach Jesus. Not our situations. Not our problems. Not our, our, our whatever. We don't line up the word to suit what we do. We line up our life to suit the word. Amen? We're to accept personal responsibility for the word. We're to accept personal responsibility for what we have in our life. Personal responsibility. The easiest thing, it's so easy and so tempting 
to blame other people. And the closer other people are to us, the more we blame them for affecting our life. We're to walk in love one to another. But nobody should cause us to compromise the word. God always has to be number one in our life. And just because something happens to me, I don't have control over their life. What I have control over is whether or not I'm going to let it affect me and whether or not I'm going to put up with it. Now, if there's pressure on you to compromise the word, you have to deal with that situation and you might have to remove yourself from it. Very quiet. So we have personal responsibility. When we accept that personal responsibility, we will have freedom all the time. We have to really understand John 10.10. I'm going to take a side journey here. John chapter 10. And Jesus said, the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And we've interpreted that as he's going to come up and steal like he's, if I'm the thief, I'm going to steal this. So now I'm the thief. No, he doesn't do that. No, no, no. We've got that wrong. What he steals, according to Mark chapter 4, the word. If he can steal the word out of your heart, if he can get you offended, if he can get you to compromise, if he can get you to put up with situations or do things you shouldn't be doing, he'll steal the word. If he can steal the word, being offended is, will steal the word. The lust of other things, deceitfulness of riches, etc., will steal the word. If he can steal the word, now he can kill. What's he going to kill? Your faith, your trust in God. You'll have no hope. And hopelessness is fatal. It's fatal. So if he steals the word, he has now stolen your faith and your hope. Now that's killed. Now he can destroy you. Because now you're totally walking according to the way of the world. You're hopeless. Well, we were hopeless when we were Gentiles. We were without God and without hope in this world, and we got born again, and we got hope. We've got a covenant. That covenant is between God and Jesus, and it will never be broken. So no matter what you do or don't do, you cannot break that covenant. And Jesus said, I've come to give you life. That's Zoe, God's life, and that more abundantly. And what is that life? How did you get that life? You got that life when you were born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, the word of God. And Jesus came that we could be born again of incorruptible seed, the word of God, and become children of God and have the whole kingdom planted within us. That's abundant life. Glory to God. Amen. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Peace, shalom. That's John 10.10. 10. That's what the thief does. And Jesus came to do the opposite. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So your image of God is not, ba if it's not based on the word, we looked at this, you have a false image of God. And if you have any image of God that doesn't line up with the word, it's idolatry. Because now you're worshiping or looking at a false God. It's not the true God. It's idolatry. 
as we said at the offering, were to honor, fear, and respect. How much weight does this word carry in your life? When you see something in here, will you change with the help of the Holy Spirit to line your life up with this word? That's honor. That's respect. That's valuing this above everything else. When you value the word above everything else, you're valuing God above everything else because God says, I am my word or one. And Jesus is the word become flesh. So if you treat the word casually, you're treating God and Jesus casually. You can't separate them. But yet we want what the word says. You know, we read it in there, glory to God, I'm going to believe for that. And we see something else or we forget about it until next Sunday or next year or, or whatever. How much weight does the word of God carry in your life? And that will be the direct proportion you receive revelation knowledge of. God's not going to give you, the Holy Spirit's not going to give you revelation knowledge of something you are going to tread underfoot or treat casually. So now let's go back to Philemon, which we're basing our study on. We looked at it before. We're going to look at it again. It's been a few weeks since we looked at it. So we'll look at Philemon, verse 6. Philemon 6. That the communication of your faith may become, or the communication of your trust, or your communication of your confidence, or your communication of your conviction that Jesus Christ is the Messiah will become effectual by acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. To expand that, I've looked up those words in, in Strong's, and you can say that the communication, participation, contribution, fellowship of your faith, your trust, may become effectual. If you're trusting somebody, you want it to become effectual or works by divine energy. Your trust in God, your trust that Jesus is the Messiah, will work by divine energy. It'll be operative, powerful, activated. How? There's only one way to get the divine energy of the word of God, of your trust in him, is by acknowledging. When you acknowledge something, you Say something. And so you're acknowledging. What do you acknowledge? Every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what you learn, have believers, about acknowledging? Speaking. Speaking. Then the power goes forth. Isn't this what it says here? The divine energy. When you acknowledge everything good in you by Jesus Christ, it works by divine energy, God's power. It's released in your words by acknowledging every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. Now, what good things are in you in Christ Jesus? We just found that out, John 10.10, 10, the abundant life. When you got born again, you got born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. The word, the whole word of God is put in your spirit. It's in here. First John, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. When you activate the greater one in you, and it's not just the Holy Spirit that's the greater one, the word of God's greater. So what's in you? Healing, deliverance, prosperity. Every promise of God in Jesus, Jesus has the promises, he's in you. Every promise of God is in here now. It's in here. We as believers who are to live from the inside out, the world lives from the outside in. We live from the inside out. So we acknowledge what God has, past tense, already given us. Has he given us all the promises that Jesus purchased? Have they been given to us? Yes. 
Does 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by his stripes we were, past tense, healed. Then has he given us healing? So is it already ours? So we have to activate what's already ours by speaking the word. I'm acknowledging what's already in me. That's how faith works. That's how trust works. I can speak, when I trust, when I have faith, when I trust, when I'm convicted that Jesus is the Messiah, that he paid the price for, my, for me, that the blessing is on me, the blessing is in me, and the blessing is health and healing and wholeness, I can confidently say, by the stripes of Jesus I am healed, and I am acknowledging that it's in me now, and I say, it's mine, I have it, and body, you line up. I can, I've released divine energy. Isn't that what the word says? I've released divine energy. Remember, acknowledge every good thing and I, when I, it becomes effectual, when I release it, it becomes effectual. It works by divine energy. It's God's power coming out of here, going through my body, putting it in line. Following. Hallelujah. Your faith, Philemon, again, it says that the communication of your faith, communication, you're participating in something. You're fellowshipping with something. That conviction, that faith, that trust becomes effectual. It will work by divine energy when I speak it. Which is why it is so important. Like King David said, Lord, put a watch over my mouth that I sin not against you, that I sin not against your word. Every time I speak with the devil, says, I'm sinning against the word of God. Whose word carries more weight, the world's word or God's word? This is how we walk by faith. That makes it easy. That makes it so easy. It's easy. But your flesh and people around you might not like it. You absolutely have to reach the place of zero compromise in your life. Somebody else wants to compromise, that's their choice. But you have to make the decision. I refuse to compromise. Compromise is really an excuse for doing what you want to do to begin with. So experience it by activating, causing divine energy to your faith, to your trust, and you're looking at everything Jesus accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's how we interpret all of Scripture, through that. The transformation in our life comes when we're focused on the good in Jesus Christ, our inheritance. What Jesus obtained by his faith. His faith got it. My faith is my trust in him that he got it and I believe him. Therefore I say. Paul said, same faith. We believe, therefore we say. If you, whatever you believe, you're going to say. Then we saw in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that everything's been freely given. And then we looked at a number of scriptures showing that out of our belly flow rivers of living water. I believe that, that that's the Holy Spirit, but it's also out of our belly flow rivers of living water. The word of God's flowing out of our spirit and it's alive and it's active and it's energized. Now, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, please. Hebrews 11, 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
We're going to look at it in the message. I'll just read it quickly out of the King James. Probably more of you are familiar with that. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Message translation. The fundamental fact of existence is this. Trust in God. This faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. Faith is a substance. Our conviction is the substance. Our trust is the substance of things, things hoped for. Those things... Wait, before we go there, let's look at one other scripture and then we'll go, go look at that. Let's look at... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's look at 2 Corinthians and then we'll swing back over to Hebrews. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's just go all the way down to... Um, We'll look at that more, but just to connect it, look at verse 18 first. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. Let's just go there first, please. While we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Could we have that in the message, please? There's far more than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see will last forever. Now, look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. The things, back to chapter 11 of Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, it's our handle on what we can't see. The things we can't see will last forever. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What is this we're hoping for? We have turned it around into houses and cars and clothes. Now, we all need those things, so just stay with me before you check out. These things that it's talking about are the same things that we acknowledge in Philemon 6, every good thing that's in us. We don't necessarily see them, but our trust in God will bring these promises to pass. So I, my faith is on my speaking healing. My faith is that God's provided all my needs. My faith is the blessings on me and in me. That will bring about the things. But the things are really talking about the promises. But we've gotten sidetracked into the natural. Yes, we need to believe God for a car. But we're not believing God for a car. We're believing that the blessing makes rich and adds no sorrow to it. The blessing has redeemed me from the curse of poverty. Therefore, I can get the other. But the things my faith and my trust is on is what Jesus purchased for me through his death, burial, and resurrection. And that is the blessing. Those are the things that we don't see, that we acknowledge because they're in us. Prosperity is already in us. The blessing is ours. The blessing makes rich. The blessing will get you your houses, your cars, and everything else. Are you following me? But we have short-circuited it all by believing for stuff. I've done it. I'm believing for a house. I'm believing for this. You know, when we, I was believing for another house, and so anyway, through the, just go right to the end. I finally said, Lord, I had quit my 
secular job because we had the church. I said, if I never get another house, I'm, I'm okay with that. But then I also saw that, you know, you're rewarded a hundredfold if you give to the gospel. But anyway, I said, you know what? So then finally David agreed we needed to move, and I was fully expecting to move into a condo. And condos are fine. I quit believing for a house because I started to get revelation of this what I'm telling you right now. Every good thing that's in me in Christ Jesus, I acknowledge it. And it works by divine energy. I got my focus back on to the word of God. I got my focus back on to Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. It got so big. In fact, what, that's one of those teachings and, and the power of the cross came out of that. We've got to know what happened at the cross. And God will meet that need. You see, he put his desire in my heart, but his desires are not my house. That's in my soul realm. His desire is for the gospel to go forth. He gives me the desires of my heart, but he puts that desire in me. My desire to be here, to minister here, for this word to go forth in the city of Edmonton was greater than anything in the natural. And it's, he put that in me. You can't dream that up. And then I sought that and spoke that, and the other came about, because he would that we have everything good. He wants us to have all things good, all things richly to enjoy. He wants us to enjoy life. Abraham was rich, but Abraham sought the promise. When he went his own way, he ended up with an Ishmael. When we start thinking we can do it instead of depending on God, we'll have an Ishmael. And I know maybe none of you have ever figured you might be smarter than God, but we did. We thought we, we had, our motive was good but we thought we could bring it to pass. Didn't work. We acknowledge every good thing that is in us in Christ Jesus. We acknowledge every good thing that is in us. Then we're releasing power. And our mind is off the things, and our mind is on Jesus. It's him we preach. Then people will see us and we won't be struggling and we won't be moaning and groaning because we will be examples of Jesus. Amen. Please stand. Sometimes we have the idea that if we make Jesus Lord of our life, he's going to ask us to do things we don't want to do. If we think that, we don't know him. We don't know how much our Father loves us. He will never, ever ask us to do something that we won't be so grateful and thankful for doing. Whatever he asks us to do is for our good. We think sometimes because we want people to do things for our good and other people to do it because they don't do it and that's why I have a problem. 
Everything God's done is for our benefit because he loves us. We're not talking religion. Religion is causes people to be bound. In religion, you can never do enough, say enough, give enough to appease an angry God. God said, I'll never be angry with you again. He took all his anger out on Jesus. Every bit of anger we deserved as sinners, he put on Jesus. And Jesus paid the price for all of God's anger towards me. Hallelujah. We're talking about a relationship. Freedom. So if there's anyone here, when I've been talking about what's in you by the word of God, that comes one way. When you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you might say, why is that important? That's important because we serve a living God. If you don't believe God raised Jesus from the dead, then Jesus is still dead. And then there's no life for us either beyond the grave. So we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And we confess with our mouth saying, Jesus, you're Lord of all. You conquer death. Hell, the grave, sickness, disease, poverty. You conquered the whole curse for me. And I can't do it on my own. I can't get to my Father without you. Jesus, come into my heart. I thank you that I'm cleansed and forgiven. I confess you are Lord. In Jesus' name, you are at that moment. Everything, when you say that, everything's been downloaded in you. If there's anybody here this morning that has never prayed that, or you're not sure, or you think you've wandered away, we invite you to come forward. We have prayer partners. You say, why do I have to come forward? Well, you don't. You pray it there. But sometimes if you don't come forward, Satan can come. The thoughts can come, well, that's really nothing, nothing happened. So we want you to be established, grounded, and firm in it. Jesus said to the disciples, Jesus said to the disciples, once they were born again, he says, hey guys, you got to stay in Jerusalem. Before you go out into that world, you need to stay here and you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Father won't send the Holy Spirit unless I go, so I'm going so the Holy Spirit can come and it's better for you if he comes. And he's come. He's here. And Jesus wants us to be filled and dued with power from on high. Praying in other tongues. You're speaking God's words over any situation that you might not know how to pray. You're speaking his words. You're releasing the power of God into that situation. Praying in other tongues and reading the word and asking the Holy Spirit for revelation and praying in tongues. You will receive revelation knowledge 10, 20, 100 times quicker than if you don't. And some of you might have been filled with the Holy Spirit and maybe spoken tongues once or twice something to do all the time and I invite you to come forward if there's anyone here this morning that wants us to agree with them in prayer for anything we're here to serve you to wait on you so we invite you forward as well hallelujah glory 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 thank you father Carolyn.